Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming along tonight. We know that there's a, a lot of discussion about um, imminent flooding, which hopefully doesn't happen. Um, but we had a large number of people uh, today respond by saying that, that they'd stay at home and join by Zoom. So I presume there's a larger number on Zoom than, than, than um, we'd hope to fill this room up with. So uh, apologies for that confusion. And um, thank you for venturing out in beautiful weather uh, and being here. I want to start by um, uh, acknowledging um, tradi traditional owners um, uh, of um, the, the country we meet on and to acknowledge um, um, uh, the Kulin Nation and um, uh, recognize that this is unceded country and that we um, recognize um, uh, First Nations people um, and their leaders, um, past, present, and emerging. Uh, we always do that particularly that's really important. Um, it's, uh, it's a small uh, gesture, but an important gesture in terms of locating where we're thinking about where we are. Um, I'm going to introduce our panel, but I won't spend too much time in introductions because I think it's better use of our time to actually hear from them, uh, both in their own opening statement, but also in the discussion that follows about what they've been doing the last 20 years and the way in which what happened in Bali 20 years ago and also um, in uh, New York and Washington 21 years ago uh, shaped the course of, of their professional lives. Uh, and uh, that's important, I think, not, not just because it's interesting in, in terms of personal story, but it, it unpacks for us what's been going on these last two decades, where we're going, and uh, what some of the challenges are and, and some of the unfinished work, but also what has been achieved. And I think uh, Clearly, the events in Bali 20 years ago were tremendously tragic, and there's nothing that takes makes that go away. It's 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 a um, it's a uh, massive human tragedy, which will always be a, a um, particularly for those directly involved, a raw wound. But there's a lot to be glad for in terms of the response immediately after those tragic events, um, and. Normally you'd think things like post-blast forensic investigations doesn't sound at all interesting to anyone outside the field, but the consequence of being able to identify uh, who had bought the Mitsubishi van used for the bombing at the Surrey Club um, and the other track down and arrest that person, Amrosi and his colleagues, pivoted everything, but we'll come back to the discussion. But let me just um, say a few opening words about our, our panel of members and uh, then I'll ask them to make some opening statements and I'll get back to them to talk about um, how their life trajectory uh, these last 20 years um, gives insights into what's been happening. So, first of all, uh, Roger Noble, who is uh, Australia's um, ambassador for counterterrorism. Um, uh, Roger has an impressive career. He's a, a, a major general in the Australian Army, um, head of uh, military strategic, strategic commitments at Australian Defence Force headquarters, but he served. Uh, in senior roles in joint operations in Iraq. Uh, he was Deputy Coalition Land Force Commander and he served in Afghanistan. Um, he was serving in Afghanistan before the Bali bombing had happened because that was, of course, a direct consequence of the 9 11 attacks. Um, he's got three masters. I won't mention all three, except to say one of them is from Deacon. Um, so that's a, a load of confidence, I think. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and of course, he is a, he's a graduate of uh, he's a Bachelor of Arts in Military History from the Australian Defence Force Academy, but um, uh, Master's in International Public Policy from Johns Hopkins and um, uh, Master of Defence Studies from the University of Canberra, Business Administration from Deakin. Um, uh, and only relatively recently into the role of um, moving out of military into DFAT, in, in Ambassador Counterterrorism, but um, seems to be constantly, relentlessly on the move. Curious learning. So I'm recently in the, in the Philippines and in Indonesia before that. So I'm very glad, Roger, you could make time for us tonight. And I apologise that it's a small gathering here, but we are recording this and it's a larger group online. Um, Sylvia is joining us via Zoom. Um, hopefully she can see us. We can't see her, but um, um, she'll indicate she's there. Yes. Yep. Good. Oh, there she is. Well, you can see her actually. That's very nice. And uh, and she's got a lovely backdrop. I think you, Sylvia. Um, so uh, Sylvia's um, spent uh, much of the last decade working as an expert practitioner in anti-money laundering and counterterrorism financing. Uh, and as she'll unpack for us, that's not just a dry technical exercise. It gives you insight into intelligence about networks and, and how groups are evolving. Uh, 
Um, she's recently finished a PhD at the, at the ANU. Um, that was looking at counterterrorism um, financing policies, but also bigger picture take away we're going with terrorism in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. So she's worked extensively. I think she's Indonesia's leading expert on um, um, uh, financial intelligence and terrorism counterfinancing. And that includes um, some really valuable insights into the role that women play because the terrorist networks are funded by small business, which was a surprise, surprise, it's generally women who are making that work, not men. Um, that's an interesting aspect in terms of the resilience. We'll come back to that a little later. And uh, Katia is uh, head of ASPE's, um, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute's counterterrorism program, which is a big deal because we don't have many um, uh, think tanks, and ASPE is one of the, the main ones in this space. Um, before joining AS, uh, ASPE, um, uh, Katia was a program coordinator uh, at the Conrad Adner um, Foundation in Australia. Um, and uh, she'll talk a little bit about that sort of that background. So she's coming from a European perspective, uh, which is a really valuable um, counterpoint to things we're discussing tonight. Uh, I won't say anything more because I'd like the, the, the panelists to, to make some opening statements that I want to sort of draw out for them a sense of that personal journey because it gives us an insight into um, a, a story that we often overlook. We sort of hear headline news, but we don't have a way of making sense of what's going on. Um, so I'll start with you, Roger, if that's okay. And you, you, you want to sit there or come here? It's easier. Yeah. But what are you more, more comfortable doing? Standing up. Come and stand up here then. Um, you can take a real standing up. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, great to see you all. Pleasure to be here. Hope I get back tomorrow. <laughs> yes. The rain. So I thought I'd start. First thing to say is commemoration in Bali. First and most important thing to remember those who were killed and the families and the friends and everybody affected by it. And I'd say in this current job, the biggest learning for me has been actually around victims of terrorism. My relationship with terrorists has been pretty direct. I haven't had a lot of time to talk, think about the victims of terror, but I've found not only we have an obligation to look after them and to support them, we actually have an obligation to listen to them. And they're the most powerful argument against violent extremism and terrorism. So this year, the UN just held a global conference on the victims of terror. Australia participated and sent some Australians who've been victims of terror. And it's a really important part of the counterterrorism uh, narrative and understanding is to understand the impact of the violence. It is not an academic thing. It's actually violent and it hurts people and damages people and impacts them over their, their whole lives, which I think we saw in the last couple of days listening to the Bali uh, victims again. Uh, so respects to them and thoughts to them. For me, on September 11th, 2001, I was a major in strategic headquarters in Canberra and I went home after a really long day doing something which was to become known as the children of the world. Mm. And I turned on the TV and I looked at the World Trade Center and something's wrong with that building. Mm. We all know that story. And on the 10th of October, so less than a month later, I was on a plane, the only first class seat I've ever sat in, on a plane to the US. And I was in first class because there were 10 people on the plane. If you remember, nobody flew for about three months after that attack. And that was to go to Afghanistan. And I'd only just come back from Afghanistan actually when the Bali bombing happened. And as a surfer, I'd spend my 20s in Indonesia, been to Bali a hundred times, been in the Sari Club many times. And I, it was jarring to me because I'd just seen it in Afghanistan. And I knew what was happening there straight away because there was an attack on the West. The, the Sari Club is in many ways, Western to the point of being offended, mm. very Western. So, and it was a, distressing to me to see that migrate across into our part of the world and then to actually attack and kill so many Australians and Indonesians and other people. So since then, I've spent my time basically on the far right of the spectrum fighting. And I actually, 2016, I was in Iraq three times when Saddam was there. Al-Qaeda in Iraq, 2005. But then 2016, 
attack to liberate Belugia and Mosul. I got a really good look at ISIS up close and personal. And I'd say as a human organization, there are no redeeming features. Uh, so it's been a, and I've watched it morph and change with often the same people and the same ideas shifting and changing and impacting different parts of the world. So first point about Bali is, and I say this, because I'm, I'm lucky enough to deal all the time with the Indonesians and the Filipinos and all our regional partners, actually globally, but particularly in Southeast Asia. <clears throat> is anything good to come out of that horrendous event? And then the subsequent bombings, second Bali bombing, what happened in Jakarta, et cetera. Uh, is the strength of the relationship that's developed between Australia and Indonesia and Australians and Indonesians. And it is very, very deep. And I think what's come out of it is a level of trust. Most Australians, I think, will be surprised. Uh, I call the Indonesians on counterterrorism like minded. I do that around the world, which often gets an interesting response. But they are. And we work closely together and we have a similar view. And for those who are close to it, you've seen the Indonesians go from that horrific event, everyone concentrates on law enforcement and intelligence, but actually they view civil society, they've worked on the human rights approach, they have respect, and it's a comprehensive view. So I'm here to say to you, uh, you should be impressed with what they've done and thankful that we've worked together to build that kind of underlying trust. And it's not just them. So that occurs across the region, but also across the world. So out of those two horrendous events have come a network of allies, partners and friends working to keep us all together safe. So last year we did a bit of a retrospective. What did we learn out of the last 20 years? And there were three big lessons I thought I'd tell you. One was, you don't win the war on terror. It doesn't end, unfortunately. So the threat's persistent but dynamic, so it changes. Uh, you can be successful, and I think probably Southeast Asia, uh, most CT professionals around the world would point at Southeast Asia and go, look at the progress made in that part of the world. We've been pretty effective in Australia, but you can't sort of say, job done, move on. The threat's persistent and dynamic and shifts. So right now, where are the hotspots in the world? Africa, the Sahel, East Africa, even Mozambique last year down in South Africa, Afghanistan, still Syria, and what's happening there. So I think the mature national approach is going to be, we've got to, oh, not to mention other types of terrorist threats. So the extreme right wing, which we call in Australia ideologically motivated by extreme, that's growing across the West. Actually, not just the West, but principally the West. North America, Australasia, Europe. So the challenge of violent extremism is an ongoing one, which we've got to read. That was our lesson number one. Lesson number two was teamwork and cooperation is the key. That's how you build it, with a comprehensive approach. So it's not just find them and lock them up. It's got to be a whole of society, whole of nation effort that we link globally, regionally, nationally, state, local in our full court press to, to protect ourselves from the extremes and the violence. And so that manifests itself in Australia, like in this city right now, there's a joint counterterrorism team you'll find the Victorian police and the federal police and the intelligence agencies all working together locally here in Victoria. And then you find it at the multilateral level where Australia and Indonesia co-chair the counter violence extremist working group in the global counter-terrorism forum. I can talk about that if you want, but so top to bottom, working with partners and friends is critical to getting with this. And then the last lesson we learned is You've got to relentlessly attack the root causes and try and prevent the appeal of violent extremism, knowing that it doesn't always work. And it's not always perfect. And things will slip through the cracks. Um, you know, 
the London Bridge attacker had been through the British Prevent Program, for example. But we institutionally and nationally think we've got to commit ourselves to prevention and countering violent extremism. So they were the three big lessons that come out of those two seminal events, not just them, because there have been many since. And I think if you look carefully and objectively, you'll see violent extremism is not the province of a particular culture or a particular type. It happens everywhere. It happens from all ideologies in all different kinds of ways. So we've got to accept that and then confront it. So I might stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. That's brilliant. I'll come back to some of those things and unpack them. Um, uh, Katia, if it's okay, I might ask Sylvia to go next to two of your readers, <coughs> um, picking up this theme of, of, of this personal story of, of how lives have changed. Um, and Sylvia, you're the youngest of us on the panel, I think it's safe to say. Um, so um, uh, that gives a presented perspective on where things were 20 years ago. But can you, um, well, um, thank you for, for joining us via Zoom. Um, I hope your audio is going to work fine in just a minute. We'll find out. Um, but uh, thank you for being here with us. And um, I, I know you've got a, a fascinating um, a wealth of insights uh, about things you've been involved in. But I can start off with just asking you to talk about um, what you've seen in your work and your life uh, as an Indonesian, particularly uh, these last 20 years since the Bali bombing. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Greg Barton. So good afternoon, Mr. Roger Noble. Good afternoon, uh, my colleague Katia, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, greetings from Canberra. So I'm Sylvia Laxmi. As mentioned before, I graduated and received my PhD from the Australian National University. My thesis examines Indonesian counterterrorism financing policies and their impact on terrorist operations in Southeast Asia and Asia Pacific. So today uh, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to discuss with all of you here to share knowledge, experience and best practices in countering terrorism and terrorism financing. Um, as we commemorate the 20th anniversary of the 2002 Bali bombings, now we please allow me to start our discussion on the development of terrorism threats, the changes of attack strategies, the evolution of funding and the efforts of counterterrorism policies done by the Indonesian government and its collaboration with neighboring countries, including with Australia as the powerful partner in combating terrorism. So terrorist networks in Indonesia have been developing rapidly. The observation of the dynamics of terrorist organizations shows at least four significant networks as ex existing in the country linked with the other groups transnationally. After the Bali bombings, the arrest of significant leaders of, and group members of Jamaa Islamia mark a turning point for the group from actively operating to consolidating members and regrouping. Two decades afterwards, uh, GI uh, or Jama'a Islamia remains active with the name, uh, the new name Neo GI. Survive and Revive is the philosophy of GI as a terrorist organization at present by modifying its strategy to achieve political power and how and how to survive rather than direct violent activities. So the group has been focusing on conducting religious preaching and recruitment which is aimed at replacing a decreasing number of qualified human resources whom the police arrested. GI has not only survived, but to some extent also thrived in Indonesia. In the absence of strong leadership, the splintering of GI and the potential for some factions to adopt violence again in the future will be a key security threat faced by the Indonesian authorities. This changing nature of GI also influenced the modification of of how they survive financially, which I will discuss later today. So, and then the second group to highlight is Negara Islam Indonesia or NII. The old NII was existed in 1949 as an insurgent movement that looked to impose Islamic law after the end of the Dutch colonization period. Currently, the spirit of the old NII provoked the resurgence of the new version of the NII group. So its visions are constant to establish an Islamic state with independent members and develop preaching to the entire population. 
to execute their plan, the group has plans to develop recruitment through preaching and propaganda, establishing educational institutions, and developing economies through entrepreneurship training for members, and building cooperative organizations for offering business loans. The group is considered active and infiltrates political affiliation while remaining expanding its power to develop. Other groups like homegrown terrorists in Poso and the new nomenclature labeled the West Papua National Liberation Army and the Free Papua Movement as armed criminal groups and people and organizations affiliated with them as terrorists also considered as other dynamics in the examination of terrorism as a threat in the country. In terms of tactics, terrorist group upgraded their operational capabilities. The suppression or splintering of GI and other ISIS link organizations has resulted in changing trends and shift in the attack tactics, starting from the use of explosive, bladed weapons, guns, and attempted chemical, biological, and radi radiological weapons to the increasing role of women and families involved in terrorism. I would like to emphasize the current tactic used by terrorist groups is to involve families in facilitating terrorism. So women have played nurturing roles, not only in transmitting radical ideology to the children or undertaking a strategic role in education and recruitment, but today female ISIS supporters also play operational roles like suicide bombers or, and knife attackers and also involved in fundraising activities. Besides the engagement of women, speaking of the growing issues of terrorism funding, current trends show three other prominent strategies. Uh, like the increasing abuse of charities through non-profit organizations, the growing application of digital payment systems, and the development of business or corporates as strategic resources to obscure illicit financing. Charities, both online, offline or through social media, are the most effective way for them to raise public support in Indonesia and in the region. These organizations may claim to support humanitarian goals, while in fact donations are used to fund acts of terrorism, including non-military activities. Terrorists may also infiltrate branches of charitable organizations, which they use as a cover to promote their ideologies or to provide material support to militant groups. Some groups use online, like digital currency and financial technology services as part of their crowdfunding activities. However, most of the existing terrorist groups in Indonesia, like the Neo-GI networks, still use conventional tactics in collecting funds from members and the public, like charity boxes, saving boxes, religious gathering events, open donation, and financial proposals to companies or individual donors. Another innovation developed by terrorist groups is to establish businesses or involve corporates to contribute financially to the organizations. Plantation oil businesses, travel agents, herbal medicine selling, electronic stores, and cooperatives are some example of their legal businesses owned by members of violent extremist organizations. For example, the, the NII Bali Group, they generated funding for their group by submitting a funding proposal to one of the government-owned oil companies in Indonesia, Pertamina, with the background of conducting environmental development activities by using a foundation as a cover. So in general, the shifting use of money is also shown in the way how terrorist groups spend the funds. They use the money for running leadership programs, funding paramilitary training and external activities, including but not limited to preaching, education, health service, social services for orphanage, widows and the poor, financial support as part of their Muslim solidarity, entrepreneurship and natural disaster assistance. However, despite the growing tactics in operation and funding done by terrorist groups, it also noted that there is a significant development in the national counterterrorism approach. So prior to the 2002 Bali bombings, Indonesia's capacity to address terrorist threats was largely limited. But then it dramatically changed when Indonesia focused its efforts on developing intelligence and terrorist arrest capabilities by passing Indonesia's anti-terrorism law, creating a dedicated counterterrorism unit under Indonesian National Police, which we call it as Densus 88, with training and financial assistance from the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, and also enhancing interagency coordination. The counterterrorism approach itself also focuses on the prevention effort by institutionalizing 
prevention, countering violent extremism, or we call it as PCVE approach. The National Counterterrorism Agency of Indonesia has been making their best effort to involve civil society organization to craft various programs by issuing a strategic plan with targets, such as reducing the spread of radical propaganda and persuading terrorists to disengage from violence. However, these programs also suffered from a lack of pretesting or evaluation mechanism, which prevented objective assessments of their efficacy. This was worsened by the fact that many deradicalization programs took place in overcrowded and understaffed prisons. Furthermore, synchronizing deradicalization programs crafted by law enforcement and respective agencies is another critical element to the successful counterterrorism approach in Indonesia. In 2018, the government expanded state capacity by enacting a new law on anti-terrorism, which enables the police to conduct preventive detention of terrorist aspect, suspects, extends the scope of activities prosecutable as terrorism-related offenses, and the way to criminalize individuals for being affiliated with a terrorist organization or acting in nonviolent operations. Among these are a variety of initiatives to counter terrorism financing. In 2013, Indonesia enacted a special anti-terrorist financing law, and Indonesia is an active member of the Asia-Pacific Group on Money Laundering. Currently, Indonesia is pursuing membership in the Financial Action Task Force on Money Laundering. Indonesia and Australia have been expanding cooperation to counter terrorism financing through intelligence information exchanges, building regional risk assessments, developing public-private partnerships, and blocking individuals and organizations with terrorists linked from engaging in financial transactions. It is clear now such a comprehensive strategic approach is required. As I believe money is the center of the gravity of terrorism, I would like to emphasize the importance of strengthening the implementation of counterfinancing of terrorism policies, particularly in the effort to address the potential abuse of financial technology, increasing roles of women, the involvement of corporates, and the misuse of charities for terrorism financing. The combination of effective policies in establishing a robust regulatory framework for fintech industries, formulating gender sensitive policies, and increasing control and monitoring donations from the community and charitable organizations are very critical. In relation to cooperation on collaboration, regional public private community partnership among uh, strategic agencies is also important to establish a strong collaboration in, in information exchange and capacity building. So in conclusion, terrorist networks are dynamic and continuously respond to the development in legis legislation, policy and procedures, technology and social trends. Therefore, it is vital now to leverage policy transformations to resolve evolving challenges. Despite the absence of major lethal terrorist attacks in the region since the 2002 Bali bombings, we need to remain vigilant and focus on strengthening counterterrorism policies. So thank you again uh, for the opportunity to share my thoughts, and I'm looking forward to exchanging views with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvia. That's fantastic. Uh, there's a lot of I've got a lot of questions to come back to you on, um, not least being how you got involved in this uh, really interesting field, what, what drew you in, but we'll come back to that in a minute um, and uh, go now to uh, Katia. And if it's okay, Katia, we'll get you up here just because yeah. of the recording of the microphone is yeah. going to work better. I'll get a microphone okay. down the front afterwards. Just setting myself a timer. <laughs> right. I wouldn't go over time, but today. Um, it's very usual. Yes, yes. yes, so I used to have the dark and I would get very scared when it started barking really loudly when I'm on time. Yeah, that, that would scare me. So, um, okay. but look, it's, but this is a very latest state. It's an informal conversational yeah. approach anyway. We've got a small number of the room, so I think that would be danger that I would just sort of forget my script and just keep talking in that time is not the essence anymore. So I set myself the timer just um, oh, thank you. Um, so there's more time for questions too. And thank you so much. Um, uh, it's a great honor to be here in, in such a steady company. Um, and, and I especially appreciate also this focus that um, that we've had here so far on the human dynamics and, and sort of for sharing um, sharing some some of the more I guess 
you know, the feely, touchy, kind of how it's, how it's usually described or sort of the, the things that make us human. I think it's it's easy to forget that sometimes when you're um, tasked with countering something and it becomes this very operational field, but at the same time, we we, we need to do that. And so I think it's, it's a really good balance um, to sort of go back and forth a little bit and and sort of zoom in and zoom out. Um, and I'm really grateful that um, that to, um, the two speakers before me have sort of showed both of that. It makes it makes it a lot easier for me. I guess it already framed my thoughts. Um, it really resonated with me, um, part of what you had said that it's about being human. Um, what we're doing here and this focus on both the victims and at the same time listening to terrorists in a very different way, but listening, not empathizing, but just understanding what drives them and not seeing them as some evil um fatalistic creature that doesn't have anything to do with that but where this actually comes from because at the end of the day it comes from somewhere from being human and it doesn't it helps in understanding that um when we also go to the some more technical things and um I, i've once heard a terrorism researcher say that when you're working in terrorism or counter-terrorism you always have to see it as a form of dialogue it doesn't mean you're sitting down at the negotiating table and um, they would listen to you, but you have to be able to to listen, also question yourself and, and your assumptions and how it affects you. And I think that's really important. Um, I think the older I get, you know, having sort of been involved in this, I guess, since 9-11 um, and how it's affected all of us, I think it's 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 harder to, to not talk about it in a human way. And I think I have to say yesterday when I was doing some research um, about this and how to kind of just present certain insights that um, at ASPE we had been talking about with a colleague of mine as an Indonesia um, specialist. It was very difficult to switch off my emotions and I'm really grateful um, that we don't have to really do that here and talk about in this clinical way. I've also just come back um, from Israel um, where I was for over two weeks um, and it was the second time this year. I'd never been before and I was invited in March to go there. Um, and just now I have to say I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be somewhere where there's ongoing terrorism activity because I think without that, it's it's it. I feel like I needed that to appreciate what it actually does to you living in a place where there's terrorism around you all the time. I've lived in other places before in the Middle East. I've lived in Syria. I've been around violence, communal violence, insurgency types of violence, but not to this extent where it's a real terrorism where someone could get on a bus and blow the whole bus up with you know children and pregnant women and all of that. And I think. Even when you're not afraid of it, because you know the statistics, but you're switched on to what's going on because it's, you know, you have a curious mind or it's your job and you feel like you need to be aware of this and you just come from a conference that was all about that. I've realized after two weeks that it does something to you, not just your nervous system where you're sort of on edge, even though you don't realize, but I think you can't, you can't switch off anymore from those things, especially when you live there. And I think that's something that's, I'm grateful for that insight because I almost, it, it makes it harder in some sense, but I think we're getting things right when when we're talking about something like this horrific violence in 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 this kind of format that you're providing, uh, Greg. And that you know, so and that's also I think how we need to look at the relationships and maybe understanding our partners um, when there's sometimes when there are frictions. I mean, as as much as the relationship with Indonesia, I think over the years I'm not an expert in this space, but as much as the relationships have been described as really warm and fruitful, there have been I think the, the kind of the weather analogies and the atmosphere have been there quite a bit. And so it's also been quite frosty at times. I remember the um around the um time of the um executions, Bali Nine. I remember that sort of one of the more recent events, but um I think that's that's been going on. I think it's important to um apply that same kind of looking to the dialogue partner across the table, whether that's a terrorist or that's our, our partner in fighting terrorism and really sort of see how it affects. And that's that's kind of my lens on on Indonesia. I, I have to say, I don't have a whole lot of um, expertise about Indonesia. I couldn't measure up with anything that um been shared before or the expertise that's in the room. But um, I lived, um, I, I was born in Germany, went to high school in the, in the US. Um, and um, my family there, they lost someone in the um, towers in 9-11. And so I was very close with them. And I'd just been there a few months before. So um, that affects you too when you see there was, you know, kind of close family. Um, but I went to university in Amsterdam and I lived as, you know, former colonial power. And I ended up, I studied anthropology 
And so I lived near the Tropical Museum, that's what it was called, Tropical Museum, that's um, a lot of Indonesian history is in there. And I ended up living in uh, the, um, near the Mulukan Plain and, uh, and then later on in the Borneo Strat. So it was a very Indonesian neighborhood and there was a lot of engagement kind of with that colonial legacy and Indonesia in general and sort of seeing how that's interwoven. So that's where I claim a little bit of insight into that. And, and I think that's something I've wanted to draw out here. And um, if, if I may, um, Roger, I'm kind of coming back to your three points. I, we hadn't spoken before about this particular event, but um, I, I almost sort of had maybe from previous conversations, I sort of had similar things in my notes. And so I'll, it, it made, made it easy for me to sort of come back to it immediately because of, uh, you, you've just drawn that out. In terms of that shifting spec picture, um, I think the, for me, what stands out having, having come from, to, to terrorism or counter-terrorism, not from an operational perspective, but from a social science perspective, studying anthropology, the science of humans, um, and what, you know, what drives people to violence aside from sort of psycho-social dynamics, but more looking at societies and the values they hold and how they've evolved over time. One thing that stands out to me also with this background I've just shared is the anti-Westernism or the anti-Americanism that runs through um, jihadism, it runs through radical Islamism in its, in its different forms, like Hizbut Tahrir, other groups. It runs through post-colonial history in itself. It runs through just separatist violence or liberation struggles. And some of what we're seeing, I think, in this space, what makes the space so complicated, where it's not just the straightforward, um, they're bad jihadi groups and we need to fight this evil sort of where we were maybe at, you know, the 10th of September, um, about 20 years ago, and sort of the first five or 10 years of the global war on terror, how that was all being framed. I think we've moved away from that and understanding it's a lot more complex, but it's without just coming back, I think, and that ferocity of um, what can only be described as just the most disgraceful and, and evil actions that I think it's easy to forget some of those mobilizing ideas that they that they're also common to other dynamics in the region. They would be common to what I see in how other nation states that are not very, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm glad I sent myself this time because I thought I was about four minutes in. Um, how, how other nations that we now describe, describe as sort of strategic rivals or adversaries, they also frame us in this way, this kind of anti-Westernism that we're morally corrupt. There's a lot of hypocrisy, a lot of human rights violations, but we claim to be the shining beacons of, of um of virtue and liberalism. And I think that's something that I don't see as going away, that some of these underlying dynamics, and that's what groups can tap into. That's also what governments tap into. And then it gets, it's, it's kind of this very messy soup. A colleague of mine, David Engel, who worked, who heads the Indonesia program in ASPI has given me a bit of a briefing from his really deep insights. And he said it goes back and forth between, you know, there's communal violence, in Poso he mentioned as well, there is a lot of the separatist stuff going on now. We have these dynamics in West Papua, and then you get all these different groups interacting with each other, but a lot of times it switches back between your near enemy, that's your state, that's not Islamic enough for some of those groups, that is morally corrupt, and then your far enemy, the US, and sort of the foreign invaders and colonizers, and then you get everything that's in between, and you get the weapons, and you get identity issues, and it just becomes this very messy soup sometimes, and that's the job of, of area experts to work that out. And I was really grateful for that insight because I think that's something looking at Southeast Asia that's very important. I know more about the Philippines than I do about Indonesia. And I always have to catch myself to not just apply that same lens. Go, whoa, yeah, I know this from the Philippines. This, this is how it must be. Um, that was my one thing. And I'll just wrap the other ones up too quickly because I think I've kind of alluded to it already. The second one was, um, sorry, um, so I've kind of wrapped on the first two with the anti-Westernism and as a driving force and also the dynamic sort of going back and forth between near enemy, far enemy, maybe more communal dynamics or separatist dynamics. And the third one I wanted to end on are values um, and the teamwork um, that, that you've alluded to. I think that that's something that I find astonishing. There's a lot to be said, I think, about that police to police cooperation work, that amazing institutional um, a character that has been set up but that has kept Australians and people in the region safer. But at the end of the day, I think what's the really outstanding bit to me is, is everything else that had to had to become 
subsumed under that. And, and the values and how people come together, you call it trust, I believe, and you would have a lot more a lot deeper insights, but just seeing how different cultures that were united by some common security interests and had, still have a lot of ongoing issues, such as you know, the recent vote in the UN, um, I think that against the um, genocide, um, the Uyghurs where, where Indonesia didn't vote that way because even though it's a Muslim country, I think that some, some of those things show that it's not, it's not as simple as values and you always have everything in common, just the same way we don't have that with, with big things like the US or, or other European nations. But I think that that enduring commitment to dialogue and to not just saying this is about security and interest, but actually understanding that what drives that is something a lot deeper. And I think that's, for me, that's counterterrorism, even though it sounds like, you know, counterterrorism, we're thinking of, you know, um, very operational things. Um, I think when I think back about what got me into terrorism, it's I was really curious about human beings. And I could have studied psychology, I could have studied something else. I just really I was I nearly joined the army. I'd almost signed up on the dotted line for officer for 12 years. Um, but they didn't, they only had logistics and medicine at the time of no, someone said to me, just become a war correspondent. I think you did it wrong for you. And I feel like in a sense I've done that, but I think that's for me, where it is when, when I'm talking about countering terrorism, it's it's about a lot more. It's about the people, and it's about understanding what what makes us tick. That very deep. I think the fiber of violence are actually ethics and morals, and I think that's sort of the framing for a lot of those things. And I, I'm happy to talk about other topics, um, in, in like more sort of I guess the more terrorism topics. I did also have some other thoughts about Papua or, or different different dynamics, but I I think. But in keeping with the spirit that sort have of been said, I think I went all out on that, the framing dynamics. So thank you for that opportunity. Thanks very much, Katia. Uh, I'll ask a couple of questions of, of the panellists, um, and then uh, we can take some questions from the floor here. But also, um, uh, Chiara is watching our Zoom group online. So if you're in the Zoom room, um, please put a question in the Q&A section so that we can see, see it and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, channel it back to the room to ask. Um, Roger, we could spend the whole evening talking about your career, uh, not not just in sort of you know LinkedIn sort of career professional sort of terms, but personal terms. Um, when you got that call to fly to the states and then go to Afghanistan after 9-11, uh, what did you think at the time? Where, where do you think this was going? Could you imagine that twenty years later you'd be still dealing with a resilient problem that wasn't disappearing? <laughs> Shouldn't ask me about Afghanistan. Just yeah. Afghan veterans. Once you start them, you can't stop them. Yeah. Well, it's, it's um, um, which is which is as it should be because it's, yeah. So yeah. Charlie Wilson's War. Yeah. Seen the movie? Yeah. If you haven't, watch it. A, hey, it's a really good movie. It's about Afghanistan. It ends at the Soviet Afghan jihad, and the CIA character Philip Seymour Hoffman. Mm. He's awesome. Right at the end, the senator says to him, "Did we win? Did we do good?" And the CIA character says, we'll see. So I kind of, that's how I think about Afghanistan. But I, I would say to you that it's a long, people forget, but there was absolutely no one saying don't go to Afghanistan in the world. So it was the biggest coalition of nations ever assembled to go to Afghanistan and get al-Qaeda. 51 countries, actually it's bigger than that. The only one that's bigger is the current coalition against ISIS, which is 85 countries, which we're a foundation member of. So what I think I learned was, and the difference is we went to get Al-Qaeda. That was the requirement. We didn't go to fight the Taliban. Didn't start that way. In fact, we had prescriptions against fighting the Taliban. Don't fight the Taliban. But that's not how the world works because the Al-Qaeda Taliban relationship is complex, still is. Uh, so what you get is a really complicated environment and it's not as simple as I take the scalpel, I cut the problem out. Uh, and I kind of knew that, but when you kind of sometimes have to experience it. So I think um, what I learned from that experience was Another way of putting it is I went to the kind of Western School of Education, so I did geopolitics, history, Western thought, nothing wrong with that. 
And I'm a soldier, right? So I'm standing on the corner in some less than developed place. And I'm looking around going, what the hell is going on here? And later in life, I did anthropology. And when I did anthropology, it started to make sense to me. And it's a combination of the two. So I think I learned from Afghanistan is be careful what you get into. Complex problems often need sophisticated, comprehensive responses. The use of force in and of itself rarely solves anything. All it does is make space for other things, maybe, uh, but it's inherently destructive. So a military solution to counterterrorism, I think, is demonstrably incomplete and ineffective alone. I'll stop because people are going to write a lot of books about what happened in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> thank you, Roger. Um, it's, it's, it's very frank and, and honest. And um, I remember that closing scene in Charlie Wilson's War List, the yeah. film version, where, you know, um, he says, you know, we won. And, and um, as you say, the, the CIA character says, well, you know, A, they, they, they don't get the New York Times home delivered, so they don't know the story that we know. And B, they'll come home to burn out homes and be told that we did it. Uh, and, of course, he was making the case for staying the course and not walking away from Afghanistan. We walked away from Afghanistan in the 1990s. The problems came back. We just walked away again last year. And we won't, we won't be able to not go back in some way because it's going to catch up with us in some way, right? We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but I think that's a very um, a heartfelt and I think very a deep statement that the use of force can accomplish certain things uh, short term, tactically. We can win with um, military means uh, short term. We get some victories, but we we can't win a global war on terror because it's not really a war that's winnable. And framing it that way is a problem. And we get these perverse outcomes. We end up with unintended consequences. Can I just yeah, please, modify please, one? You sure. do need force. Yes. Yeah. I'm not, okay. So there are times when you've got to have the force piece, got to use the rest. Ice, ice was a classic now. Yes. Like you've got to make space. There's no dialogue happening where you can get there without force. But force alone is not going to get to your root causes and solve your problems. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And of course, with the war in Ukraine at the moment, we can see how when you're facing literally an existential threat, um, you, you need to be equipped um, and, and supported to defend yourself. It's, it's life or death for the Ukrainians and, and, and they're doing a good job. And wishful thinking about you know not having militaries and not having wars doesn't make that the, their problem go away. Counter uh, counterinsurgency is a more complicated problem, isn't it? Because without that anthropological understanding, we end up making mistakes we didn't intend to make. But we'll come back to that in a minute, perhaps. Um, Sylvia, I wonder if I could ask you um, about what got you into this field as as a young Indonesian. Um, why end up looking at uh, terrorism financing, counterterrorism, uh, and financial intelligence? Thank you, Greg. Uh, so I start uh, my career uh, in this area when I joined uh, Indonesian Financial Intelligence Unit in 2007. So we work in money laundering in the past, but then when I graduated from my master in terrorism financing in 2012, that's the first start of a financial action task force on money laundering when they formulated the recommendations on terrorism financing. So start from the 2012, I focus on uh, investigating uh, illicit money for terrorism. I visited uh, and worked uh, a lot with the uh, Australian Federal Police and Austrac uh, in that time, try to try to track down the money uh, has been uh, sent to Indonesian uh, entities uh, related with terrorism funding and link with the networks in Australia. As we all know, it's very easy for the diaspora to collect money from the public and sending to terrorist group uh, or terrorist members and uh, link and their linkages in Indonesia, and then this money uh, they uh, start to use it for funding people who want to to travel to Syria. So that's the the first time I was working uh, and focus on terrorism financing. And then after that, we had a lot of collaboration with the financial industries and law enforcement prosecutors. And because of there is a like a little research about terrorism funding, even in that time before I finished my PhD, we didn't have so much information about the picture of terrorism financing networks in Indonesia. So when uh, we, uh, when I talk a lot with uh, 
uh, my colleagues from law enforcement and financial industries, then there is a, an urgent need to be fo more focused on terrorism financing in more appropriate academic research. So that's why uh, in that time, in 2016, I applied a scholarship to go to the ANU uh, and focusing on uh, 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 making a big picture of uh, terrorism financing network in Indonesia and also try to evaluate the counterterrorism financing policy in Indonesia. Um, in other side, we have a good compliance rating from uh, uh, from the APG and if ATF. But the fact is, when we talk with the grassroots area, with the community, the money is still increasing from the public. So uh, there is a, a, a good time in that to uh, try to research what's going on with the terrorism financing. And there is a need for uh, policymakers to understand uh, the actual terrorism financing network in Indonesia. So that's why uh, we can also adjust the policies in the future, how to counter the emerging trends uh, in terrorism financing. So that's uh, my story about the start of my career in terrorism financing uh, policymakers. Thanks very much, uh, Sylvia. And, and I think you've touched on one of the themes tonight that, that we opened with, with Roger's statement, that we're dealing with a very resilient threat that keeps on reinventing itself. And when groups don't, um, when they refrain from engaging in violence, it gives them a breather, it gives them a chance to build their, their networks, in this case, networks that focus on uh, an understanding of religion that you know, is obsessed with um, developing pure communities. And then there's a liminal space where People have a right to their own convictions, their own ideas. They can believe in having a caliphate if that's what they believe, or an Islamic state. Um, they shouldn't be persecuted for those beliefs. But then what do you do when that network suddenly sparks up, somebody gets impatient and goes back to using violence? I mean, the, um, the Afghan uh, alumni who came back from uh, uh, training in Afghanistan, Pakistan, most of them didn't want to be involved in violent jihad in Indonesia. Just a few broke away and... That was the story of the Bali bombing, Nordin Top, the Malaysian recruiter, led all of those operations through the 2000s. So it's, 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 um, it's challenging, isn't it? Um, I'll come to you in a minute, Katia, but I, I want to ask Roger one more question. Uh, look, this is not a question that's easy to answer, but it's, it's a question that's good to ponder, and that is, uh, for all of the success, uh, what do we understand about why this problem is so resilient? I'm, I'm struck by the fact that Detachment 88, Densus 88, is increasingly sophisticated and relatively transparent, accountable, um, certainly hardworking, exceptional intelligence work. Uh, they constantly succeed in detecting and disrupting uh, would-be attacks. Very few get through, thankfully. And yet, after, well, 20 years of this activity and, and then being in formation for 18 years, uh, every year they're arresting two, three hundred people. They have to then go to a magistrate and get get uh, make a case for why that person should be prosecuted. Then they go to courts, open courts. Uh, mostly they get successful prosecution, so they're not just making this stuff up um, as false metrics. It's a real threat. How come it can be so resilient when uh, these networks are under such surveillance and so pinned down? How come they don't just sort of um, diminish and dissolve? Um, and of course, globally, we, we, as you said, Africa, it's now, it, it, the problem is getting steadily worse quite quickly, um, even though we've had success in, in the Middle East and some, last, some success for the time being in Afghanistan. I think, oversimplified answer, but last year, there was photos of Victorian boys in the Grampians doing Nazi salutes. Mm -hmm. Average age, they're in their teens. Have you seen those photos? Well, Adolf Hitler's been dead 76 years. Um, the Third Reich is gone, right? I reckon most of those kids doing that don't know who he is or don't really understand the history of it. My point is you can't keep, it's impossible to kill ideas, good ones and bad ones. So ideologies and ideas, so the root logic of Islamist extremists, Al-Qaeda and they would track it right back. So I think you're always dealing with resilient ideas and ideologies. And when they connect with the right bunch of humans, they respond. So I had a long talk to Homeland Security in the US Saturday. What's the difference between a school shooter and the Buffalo shooter, the guy who did the attack in Buffalo? He's a terrorist. He's a mass murdering criminal. 
they're both kind of young males. So I think it's when ideas fit febrile ground and they take root and they appeal, that's when you get responses, particularly when the ideas hold violence as a as a as a tool. And then I think it's the other big thing we haven't talked about much. I had a conversation last week with some like-minded friends of ours, Australia, and we all think that the term lone actor is a disaster. There's no such thing. It's the 21st century. So a 15-year-old kid in Albury, Wodonga or somewhere, locked up, not at school, home from COVID, looking at not talking to anybody face-to-face, -face, gaming online, connected online. So the digital world has connected everything. 24-7 ubiquitous, and it's not just rich, rich countries. So the biggest Facebook users in the world are from what country? It's actually the Philippines because it's free. There's no data charged. So I think that just exacerbates the first point. You probably had to run, run into a bunch of Nazis in 1940 to become a Nazi. Now you can be sitting in, the, in Victoria communicating with neo-Nazis who might be in the United States or somewhere else or same with the Islamist network. So that all of those things are kind of terrifying and mean we've just got to stay ahead of the curve uh, as a society. It's a resilient, uh, unending frame of problem. Framing as a war is not, not a smart way to frame it, is it? Yeah. It kind of looked like that at the time. No, no, it seemed like uh, and, and what you're... What you're um, uh, getting at there, Roger, is persistent of ideas, which is certainly true, but, but ideas locked into social networks, whether virtual, um, you know, somebody you've met on just online or somebody face to face. Um, and that's where, as you said, anthropology gives us insight. So that's the cue to ask uh, uh, if they have some questions about, about this. Mm, maybe I don't have that question even super fascinating. Yeah. Roger, yeah. Maybe just a brief comment on, you know, coming from Germany and, and, and um, understanding Europe well. Uh, it's not just that the ideas of, of, of fascism and Nazism have been around for you know three quarters of a century, but the social networks in various forms have continued unbroken or at least have managed to pop up again. Um, what are your reflections on how social networks and friendships and ideas come together with terrorism? There in a sense, when we're talking about sort of the breeding ground, we were always, I guess, talking about terrorism and it's kind of in terms of pathologies, there's contagion, you know, like a virus, and there's, there is, um, yeah, I guess breeding ground, you know. So, but I think it's a lot of terrorism dynamics are actually the dynamics of social movements. I think they're just taken to, to an extreme. Um, one of the first things I learned that was really eye opening to me when I took sociology was that, and the teacher she was from France and had spent a lot of time, um, also looking at, um, I think. Algerian civil war and some, you know, sort of the violence of colonial nations, more like like France or the Netherlands, um, saying that every utopian movement or every social movement that wants to bring about a better order um, has this kind of totalitarian seed in it. Because when you think that what's going on here is so bad and we need to overturn this, no one wants to start with violence to begin with, unless you're ISIS, probably there are those exceptions of, you know. But usually it starts with something good. There is some repression going on when you look at, for example, Fidel Castro and, and, and that kind of anti bautista action. It was injustice and it was this revolutionary group, but then they ended up creating repression in return. And, and so I think I, I don't look at it as something that's particular to terrorists. I think it's it's how it's how when you have ideas, how they how they come to fruition because we're a social being. So there will be networks behind it. That's sort of the first very general one. I think that's why you see this ebb and flow between certain groups they've been around for so long, but then are really quite extinguished or maybe they morph, they fracture, and then they turn into something else um, with the passage of time um, or it's just structural conditions like we've had the Taliban, now we have the Taliban again. Some say it's Taliban 2.0, some say they haven't really changed in essence. In their ideology, they're just, they now need to go from insurgency to having to govern. So they have to adapt and they probably have to be more pragmatic about their accommodations. And I think those are some of the more enduring principles. What I found fascinating um, when I spent some time with my colleague over the last few days to give me those real, his deep insights on, on Indonesia there, 
was that he said it's it's a place that's very unique where you have those different dynamics in one place where you have the you have jihadi groups but you also have just radical islamist groups who are not necessarily their first objective is not violence it's justice for muslims or having a, having more of a say and then you have your separate groups and you have or separate violence that also didn't begin with a desire to violence it was just we want to have a say in the state we want to be seen or heard and we want to have our rights and so everything's framed in in kind of value terms but then you also just get just people being greedy and they want to make money of weapons and um then there's oppression of sort of muslims versus Christians and that plays out in counter-terrorism and that was the thing that stood out to me um and I think that's sort of something maybe to what that would be my morsel to take away was that kind of action and reaction dynamic between terrorism and counter-terrorism I think Indonesia is a very fascinating space in that sense because I think it's so complex I could only imagine if, if you're part of D88 and you, you you know it's so hard to do your job already and, and you're risking your life but then now you have to also think about how what, what you're just trying to do your job, but then it affects how what group you're using that against when you're using counterterrorism legislation and counterterrorism measures. That that law that you mentioned, Sylvia, I found that really fascinating when that came out because it's similar to it gives you unprecedented powers to detain someone for I think up to a week. But now when you're using that in your own, you have a country <laughs> where they're separate as well. So and the question is, should we just use normal criminal law or should we use counterterrorism law? Or if someone I, I could only imagine like the, the dilemmas that are there. And, and that's something I think to be factored in. And I think that's maybe also how the landscape changes. That's something I've seen in the Philippines or in other places where they've had peace processes. Often that, you know, and, and what I've recently seen in um, having lived in Syria and then worked with Palestinians a lot and I haven't seen things from the other side, there's terrorism, but then there's also um, the other groups as a state terrorism and it's an apartheid state. And, and those dynamics. And then when you're trying to find legal approaches, it literally comes down to something like this. Why did you not use a criminal justice approach here? Why did you use a terrorism approach? Because that's kind of this, this retribution that you're trying to use against a group you don't really want in your country. The same with Marawi. That's that's in very simplistic terms, I think. Um, that's, for me, what that complexity of it's not just counter-terror, it's not just about um tactical things but it's about some bigger questions of nation building and inclusivity and I think that's where it gets it gets complicated but also fascinating in a sense because I think that's where there is some leverage as well to get things right by understanding them right. It's very difficult to give this concise answer. It, 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 no, it's a, a great answers and, and I wish we had more time tonight. I'm conscious we're running out of time so I, I better throw questions to the floor into the Zoom group before we do run out of time. I'm really tempted to talk about nation building now, mm. Afghanistan, Iraq, um, because there was actually a lot that was done really well in Afghanistan amongst all the things done badly. We didn't get a chance for that to endure. I mean, education of girls, transformed urban society, and, and some good work done in Iraq as well, but it's very hard when you're dealing with counterinsurgency and occupying to then do nation building at all well, particularly when you're told it's not your job. I think another... We'll come back to it in a minute, perhaps. But uh, questions from the floor from our Zoom group? We do have some from Zoom. Okay. Well. So Prasad said, do you think economic dimension is important? Not aimed at anyone in particular, so. Well, maybe we'll start with Sylvia, because uh, I mean, I think, Sylvia, um, you were talking about um, FinTel, financial intelligence and um, Studying, uh, studying terrorism and financing, but I think what you're telling us is that it's really about understanding this. Trying to deprive groups of access to the money that knows them to function, that's one thing, but really it's about understanding the social networks. It's, it's tracking how those social networks function, whether it's at the family level or at the sort of, you know, national level, um, by looking at where the money goes. Um, but is is uh, economics and economic need a, a major driver, or is it just something that comes along after the facts? Mm -hmm. Does poverty uh, cause terrorism? Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, for for the question, uh, is uh, economic di dimension important? Uh, do you mean for the terrorist members, or for us to tracking the funding? Well, it's it, it's uh, both, but I think I think there's. Sort of perhaps an implicit question about whether poverty mm. causes terrorism. I think we understand that it doesn't in a simple fashion. Uh, 
Um, but it does depend on context. Some people can be induced mm -hmm. to do something if they're under pressure. Um, yep. Western Mindanao is different than, than Java, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but but from your perspective, what, what do we learn from um, paying attention to where the learning goes? Um, from uh, my understanding and my observation, it depends on the terrorist networks. Uh, for the masterminds, uh, the ideology and the narrative to establish an Islamic state uh, in Indonesia and in the region is the most important one. But for those, uh, when they recruited members uh, in the past before, uh, like in the terms of uh, GI, when they did um, Bali bombings, there is a promise for the suicide bombers that you get uh, uh, like a uh, martyr, if you want to go for martyr, uh, and then you will be uh, get a pleasure from the angels and everything. But now, uh, when you have a look at the conviction and interview investigation report for, uh, among them, most of them uh, have been uh, promised by the terrorist group, if you want to join, if you want to be a suicide bombers, they will take care of your families. So uh, some of the husband or the, the father, they are willing to sacrifice themselves because they see they are very, uh, some of them very poor and then they don't have any stable income, especially during the pandemic. The only uh, a way out for, uh, for their families with welfare is joining this terrorist group and then they can take care. As you can see, the terrorist groups now intentionally establish a charity foundation, or we call it like a Baitul Mall. Baitul Mall is a microfinance institutions that giving business loans to them, especially giving scholarship for them, health service. But one of the fact that we found out uh, when we, it's in, uh, I think when the solo, uh, solo police headquarters uh, was exploded, we found in the in, uh, funding investigation that the terrorist group only gave, uh, I think pretty similar like uh, $60 to the wife of the suicide bomber. So this, uh, this fact, we try to educate them that uh, there's no such a promises like that. In, in one case, they may promise you to take care of your families, but in fact, there is another uh, motivation for them like for the gen regeneration, for example. Another thing, when I talk with my colleagues in, in the Southern Philippines, they said uh, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, terrorists already uh, surrendered to the government because like Katia said, in the Philippines, the dynamic is quite different. They also have Communist Party, CPP, NPA under terrorist list. So these, uh, these people already surrender to the government, but the problems in the politics and also the problems of the economics in the Philippines, for example, inspired them because the, the, the terrorist group offered the mothers to, to be the courier for the terrorist group. So because they feel they don't have any money, it is very hard for them to reintegrate to the community after they surrender. Uh, then they, they thought, how can I feed my kids? So then the terrorist group, uh, see this as a, an opportunity for them to recruit them again. So they promise you not involved in the operations, you are not, uh, you, you, you are not involved in the uh, violent activities, you just involved as being a courier or a logistic, which is in terms of uh, terrorism finding, uh, terrorism financing, it's already involved in a terrorism financing, even as a passive, uh, in a passive roles. So this kind of economic dimensions uh, for the field uh, uh, operators for people working in the field and members of and sympathizer, they use economic di dimension as one of the motivation uh, for them to recruit more members for the terrorist organizations. Thank you, Zoe. That's really, really helpful insights. Um, I guess takeaway from all of this is there's no simple answers, right? There's no simple mechanisms. And I haven't read it, read the Global Terrorism Index, which is a good open source. Mm. Summary: It's not rocket science. Like most terrorist attacks, globally occur in areas in conflict. So I would, there's not a cause and effect relationship, but where there's poverty, poor governance, conflict, the potential for disenfranchisement and the appeal of violent extremism is higher. Yeah. Doesn't mean you can be a really rich Westerner and still be a terrorist. So, so cause and effect. But it's if you look in Africa, I. When you look at it, you've got weapons trafficking, human trafficking, organised crime, no borders, failed states, mercenaries. No, no climate change, droughts. Yeah. Climate change, poor food security. 
is it any wonder that uh, these ideas resonate with some a pretty small group of people actually, but enough to be pretty fundamentally disruptive? We had a question, and I wonder if it actually please, just please directed please. back to, to to you because yeah. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, because I'm yeah, looking at exactly that global terrorism index, or also looking at, you know, sort of you look at conflict and you have an insurgency and you go, is, is a lot of this, they use terrorist tactics, but in its nature, isn't it just, is this just, if you did crisis, if you did more crisis work, you wouldn't have to do so much CVE work or should we actually do less of this? And I wondered in the case of Indonesia, if this was a particularly pertinent example, um, because a lot of when just looking at what's happened with that Bangsamoro peace process, and we often look at you know to the bad and we think, oh, the Taliban coming back to power, this can be a motivational boost to jihadi groups in the region. But if we look at it the other way, being able to, I mean, there, it's still not over, there's still potential for conflict, but it looks like a bit of a success story that can also be a demotivator, maybe that go, well, actually, maybe we don't have to do so much terrorism, there's actually a better way. Um, after, and seeing that in how, how ISIS tried to to kind of take over that city and and build a caliphate that really wasn't a success, success story it was meant out to be, but the better success story is sort of that longer term peace and conflict work. So do, do you think in the Indonesian context or in general that there should be more crisis prevention and crisis work, and that it's it's overhyped a little bit the CVE, especially in countries where there are those types of conflicts? Yeah. I mean, let me just add to your quick. Go on from the general to the how, yeah. how Australia does it yeah. inside Australia. So instead of talking about them, talk about us. Mm. So we have what we call social cohesion because we're not quite sure what to call it. But that's all the stuff you do to make the society peaceful, law abiding, and coherent, right? It's not countering violent extremists, it's about you know, respect for the rule of law, domestic violence is bad. So that's, if you like, an inoculation effort by the society against all kinds of abhorrent behaviour. And then you use CVE against really specific groups who are at risk for violent extremism. You know, in this state that happens every day. They're pretty targeted efforts, actually. What I don't think you do is do CVE against everybody because it's a, the narrative of that is, is pretty destructive. And then you do counterterrorism against terrorists, who's an even smaller group of actual, you know, they're, they're in the terror. That's how Australia kind of tries to thread that needle. But I forgot to tell you, so I was in the southern Philippines last week. The armed forces of the Philippines said to me, terrorism starts where the road ends because it's development. And, and then I asked one of them, I won't tell you who or where, but a local leader, I said, what are the three things you do to stop terrorism? First thing was uh, certify land rights, be able to confirm who owns what piece of land. Is that the answer you expected? And then the second one was identity. Mm. Someone be able to prove who they are. Because mm. those two things go to this social fabric so it wasn't anything about, oh, you need a... Oh, the last one was actually what you might expect. Hey, it would be good if the Islamic Council in the Philippines moderated teaching across the Philippines a bit more systematically. But the first two were really about, you know, social cohesion and economic certainty and identity all linked together through land. And we've long worked on... Um... Uh, community development and international development. AusAid now sits in your department, um, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade with AusAid in there. And I think we've been uncomfortable about crossing over between development and dealing with problems like extremism. And yet most development occurs in areas where there's poverty and there's violence and, and there is extremism in one form or another. So we're, I think we're coming around to the fact we have to engage. So I talked to the one of the learning for me, he's talking to the whole development world, which is a whole thing. Mm. And I kind of say to him, okay, because I get lots of rules. You're not allowed to spend development money on this, you're on this, and blah, blah, So I say to him, I don't care what you call it. I just care about the effect. Mm. So you don't have to do CVE. If you're teaching judges to run courts properly, which we do all, all over the place, it doesn't have to be counterterrorism. Mm. A good legal system 
helps with counterterrorism, helps with organised crime, helps with social code. You know what I mean? So I, we try to go. It's about the effect, not the label. And then use the label. Know what you're doing when you use the label. So if you call something CVE, it's probably in it. We don't do much CVE. Mm. We do a lot of development. Mm. But if you look at it in total, even in the Philippines, where we do quite a lot of CVE, it's much less than the development effort that Australia has. But if you look at it in total, it's kind of coherently trying to address, assist the locals to uh, stop violent extremism, but also help them get rid of some of the root causes that help inspire that without labelling it. Um, and it's a fraught subject. So go to the UN, you'll get a lecture off all kinds of entities about what you can do and can't do. Yeah, the labelling and framing things are so yeah. important, isn't it? Uh, but but, but it, it is good that the people are talking across their different yeah. backgrounds now because we are working on common themes. Um, questions from, from the room? Um, yes. Yep. I'm not sure, but just a question. Oh, sorry, my name's David. Sure. Um, I'll your mic there, so I'll still be that. Uh, okay. So I'm very interested in this social cohesion aspect. And uh, um, on Monday, I was at, uh, attending a talk given by Big Health. And I thought, so there's the Big Health Silo talking about sort of social cohesion stuff. And there's you talking about social cohesion stuff. I was wondering if you talked to Big Health. Yeah. Social cohesion is not a counterterrorism thing. Yeah. Um, so, on this, please. Yeah. so it's a national thing. Right. So it's in the counterterrorism strategy, but the lead of the federal government is actually home affairs. That's not about CT. Oh. So the answer is all of the states and all the local communities and all of civil society are the social cohesion. It's not a government thing, actually. So health's part of it and every government entity, but also civil society and um, local government and they're all part of the mix. So Australia actually measures social cohesion, which I find really interesting. And we just put a whole lot of money into it to try and do it better. So to me, it's just amazing, like how the hell do you measure social cohesion? So we measure intent and behaviour and trying to see how inocular, how resilient we are actually, not just against fire extremism, but floods and fires and mental health and all of those things. So I think it's a, the answer is whether you like the term or not, I think that's the one they, they use, but it is a whole of it, society effort, not just governments. Yeah, I'm just doing some work on uh, virtues and I might pass on later. Thank you very much for that really good question. Yeah. And a question from our Zoom group. Um, we've got one more from Victoria who said, can you weigh in on right-wing extremism and the different strategies this terrorism requires? How might we address this in the future? Well, it's a good question. And and, and I think um, as Roger was intimating earlier, um, it's not just white supremacists and neo-Nazis. Uh, there's problems in Asia and Africa with toxic identity politics and this um, far-right um, current narrative of the great replacement that these other people are taking away our, our land, our, our, you know, they're, they're displacing us, um, is something that's covered around the world. So uh, in Myanmar, uh, with the persecution of the Rohingya, uh, Hindu extremism in India, street protests recently in Leicester that seem to have some really worrying threads. But yeah, also also white supremacists and, and Nazis as well. Probably ethno supremacists, right? Yeah. And it, then it makes more sense. Yes. Because yes. then you see it everywhere for what it is. Yes. It's kind of that I guess that jostling for power and rights and land, like an identity and like who who's the top dog in a society and gets to have the benefits. But so I think then you understand so because there's quite a bit of that happening in Asia across Asia, and and but you don't quite understand it when you think of it in terms of white supremacy. You're like, but but they're not white. How can they say this? It's about you know, and it gets mixed in with class and religion and and race, and and especially in those kind of post-colonial states where you have 
that mix, then it looks like it could be relig one religious group dominating or another one. But it's it's maybe that's just how that order fell into place at the time. But it's more about class and distribution of resources. Who's the victim and who's yeah. yeah. And then there's obviously some things always happened. Then you can you can sort of claim make claims to victimhood and have these competing claims. Yeah, there's an endless terminology argument. Endless. <laughs> so Australia has religiously motivated violent extremism ideologically motivated violent extremism, they're umbrella terms. Under the ideologically motivated violent, and you can find fault with any, what, whatever you want to pick, ideologically motivated violent extremism comes all of those ethno-nationalist, racist, um, white supremacist, Nazi, they're all there. The other Australian policy is call it what it is. So whatever box it's in, if it's a bunch of neo-Nazis, Call them neo Nazis. It's okay. Call them neo Nazis. So they're quite different to the ISIL Al Qaeda. They've got a lot in common, but they're quite different. And I'll talk about the Australian context. So actually, it's a Western thing. If you talk to white supremacists, great replacement. So there are a hodgepodge of ideas that defy any car logic. So when the Taliban took over, in Afghanistan, they got support from right-wing extremists in the United States. Go okay, figure, right? Because see what patriots with guns can do. So it's and online. The house yeah. Too. yeah. Keep and, and it's diffuse. So they're, they're not as organised. Islamic State. When you call yourself a state, you're organised like a state. You're a bureaucracy, actually, which is great for... Westerners to bring it to pieces, which I'm helped to. It's very difficult in this diffuse set of ideas. And the, the transition between, so they're just not organized enough. So we use our listing regimes against them, for example, but they change their names and they change their membership and they change their identity. So it's a, a new kind of problem set, uh, globally connected. So, uh, when you get so what do you do about it? And I talked to the Victorian police about it because they've been wrestling it. And one of the things they said to me was, well, when you deal with Islamist extremism and you've got people on a risk path and they're trying to get them off, there's no shortage of mentors in the Islamic community who can be impactful on people, right? And they say it's not the same with the extreme right wing groups who often are rural young boys, uh, so the local town policeman ain't the guy. So they've actually, so that's an example of a specific problem. How do you find the role models and mentors to help that particular cohort when in this other set, actually there's a whole standing system that can help. Um, so yeah, it's, we're really trying hard, Australia is to understand this thing. And that's why we put a lot more effort lately into talking to the Americans, the Europeans, the Canadians uh, about the phenomena because it's a, like most bad ideas, I like to tell the foreigners, we import most of them from overseas. We don't really make them up ourselves. Uh, but So it's a big challenge, I think. Yeah, and the, uh, the Australian terrorist who killed 51 people in Christchurch in, in March 2019, um, what group did he belong to? He didn't belong to any group. He was a lone actor, but lone actor, as you say, underplays the fact that he was playing to a global audience, live streamed, uploaded the manifesto. Um, He's an icon now. Yeah, and, and he was following another icon from 2011 in, in Norway and others, yeah. And uh, one of the ideas in his manifesto was, you know, eco-fascism, fighting for the planet. So it's, as you say, it's complicated. Uh, but we've drifted a little bit from Indonesia, but these are issues that are, Back in the Indonesian space, we started off by saying, I think, and maybe I'll find a word from Sylvia, um, when groups do things that focus on, on teaching and building community and they're not breaking laws, they're not involved in violence, then they, they shouldn't be persecuted. Um, and it's not the police's job to go around, you know, they, they've got to keep an eye on them, um, but um, that's not terrorism. And yet that's where terrorism regenerates from very often. Um, what do you see the future in Indonesia, Sylvia, in terms of the resilience of these networks? What, what, should, what should we prepare for and what do we need to focus on? Yeah, uh, as you said before, uh, Greg, uh, uh, about 
how the group uh, works now. It's not uh, directly to do violent activities, but they are more developing the networks and gaining public support. So the, the importance that I, uh, I see for, for the future is how they get resilient by using a foundation and get into political, uh, uh, for example, political parties or give, uh, having more representative in the politics and in the government because they are not doing violence. So they got more sympathy from the publics. But in the other side, uh, this kind of sympathy, they use it uh, for uh, like gather more people to get uh, uh, in, a, in a public gathering or something like that. And that's the way also they ask for funding for their terrorist group. And then the money, they're not channeling to make bombs, for example, or to buy explosive material or to buy weapons, but they, they try to use the money for building the new generation of these uh, radical networks for, for the future by funding for health service for the families or uh, even giving incentive for scholarship that's more important for people now in Indonesia. And then they will we'll have a look to this organization rather than to the government because it's very hard. Uh, like uh, how many uh, population in Indonesia and in the government, that's why the government should work very close with the community, civil, so, uh, civil society organizations, because we need to monitor, we need to know, know your neighbor, know your friends rather than uh, the law enforcement approach. Because uh, as I mentioned uh, before, at the beginning of this event that the uh, survive and revive, that's their focus now, rather than doing uh, violent activities or preparing for attacks. Yeah. Thank you. That's that's great, Sylvia. Um, I wish we had more time. Um, it's, it's always a sign of a good conversation when you leave wishing you had more time. Um, there's a, a larger group uh, online, but it's not just online right now in real time. Um, this is recorded. I'm grateful for that because we'll tie it up and put it on YouTube. Uh, it's a great resource because it's been such a, a really good conversation. Um, we've only just begun to get into some of the things the lessons of the last two decades, um, grounds for optimism, but also being realistic about mistakes and challenges. And there's nothing easy or simple about this, but we do need to deal with a, a human problem. Terrorists present themselves as freedom fighters, responding to legitimate human needs and grievances. Um, and people need to belong and be part of a group, but we need to be smart about cutting off the opportunity for them to do harm. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks uh, Sylvia. Thanks, thank Katia, you. and thank you, Roger. Thank you um, for, for both of you for coming down here to Melbourne. Um, it's been really, really, really good. Start. <laughs> yes, and, and hopefully, good. hopefully you don't get flooded on the way home, and it all goes well. <laughs> no, Tullamarine doesn't flood. The the uh, the road to the airport doesn't flood, at least not historically. Um, there are some low bridges around uh, South Melbourne you don't want to go under. <laughs> that um, regularly cap catch uh, people unawares, but uh, um, but uh, we face a planet that is facing lots of those problems, and it's going to be an accelerant to the issues we've been talking about. As you mentioned, not least Africa, but it's, it's going to be involved also in Asia. Uh, so much more to talk about, but no more time. So we'll come back. Hopefully, we can come back perhaps next year and do something again together. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone.